Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the first Queers in Science lecture uh, as part of the Midsummer Festival. Um, of course, and it deals, of course, with Australia's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is quite topical for the last year. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Burrawong and, and Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, well, what a year it's been. I just realised the last time I've been on this stage was actually a, a whole year ago. And, uh, and the museum had just closed and we were actually doing a lecture which got filmed. Now, looking at the, um, the last year, I've actually been working on a project called Collecting the Curve. And that's been looking at the social, political, economic, and the scientific effects of the pandemic. As part of that, we've been working with many people like the Doherty Institute, CSL, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, First People's Health and Wellbeing, and the Western Health and Austin Hospitals. We've been looking at things like vaccinations, about the messaging, about research, and also different things like that. Um, and also I've been working with people like the Tower Lockdown and the Sikh volunteer community. So it's been a really been an interesting project. And uh, yeah, so it's been a very large collecting project and we'll be sharing that through with you through different um, portals like our collecting uh, museum collections online. Um, anyway, I'll hand over to Michael Traeger, who will be your um, coordinator tonight, and he will introduce the speakers and we'll talk about today's lecture. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, hi everyone, and welcome to our Queers in Science 2021 lecture series, and welcome to those people viewing online at home. My name is Michael Traeger, and I'm part of the Queers in Science Victorian Committee, and I'm also a PhD student at the Burnett Institute. So I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Bunurong on the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Aboriginal leaders, um, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, at Queens in Science, we also acknowledge that in many ways, Aboriginal people in Australia were the first scientists and have been practicing the scientific method for over 60,000 years. So a little bit about um, who we are at Queens in Science. Um, so Queens in Science is an initiative that started here uh, in Melbourne, but we now have chapters in all states and territories across the country. And basically um, we aim we aim to build community and improve uh, support for LGBTQI plus people working in STEM. So that's science, technology, engineering, maths, and medicine. The vision of Queers in Science is to foster and champion inclusion of LGBTQI plus people within STEM organizations, recognizing that welcoming and valuing LGBTQIA professionals and students not only benefits the individuals, but the organizations and the STEM workforce. So, uh, so the Queers in Science vision is supported and driven by five cornerstones. These are visibility to empower emerging and established LGBTQIA plus professionals working in STEM and to showcase the important contributions that members of our community make to the field of science. Advocacy within STEM organizations to implement best practice policies and promote safe and inclusive workplaces for all. Networking to provide a safe and inclusive nexus for LGBTQIA plus individuals in STEM to engage in social and professional networking and mentoring. Education to raise awareness of the roles that STEM organizations and colleagues play in creating a welcoming environment for LGBTQIA plus individuals. And finally, intersectionality to provide the inclusion, uh, to prioritize the inclusion of LGBTQIA plus people in STEM facing compounding types of discrimination on the basis of belonging to multiple marginalized groups. We embrace people of diverse ethnicities, cultural backgrounds, disabilities, religions, ages, and gender identities. So if you wanna get involved, we run a number of networking events, professional development seminars, and once a month we have a social event. Um, so please uh, check out our website and sign up to our mailing list and follow us on Twitter at Queers in Science. So before I introduce our speakers today, I'd like to thank our event partners, uh, the Royal Society of Victoria, Melbourne Museum, Midsummer, and uh, Inspire Australia for their fantastic support in making these lectures happen. I also want to remind everyone that we have another lecture evening coming up on the 5th of May with another two um, fantastic speakers who will discuss their work on ecology. So as I invite our speakers up, just to remind people at home, you can ask questions in the Q&A box and we will have a Q&A session um, following the presentations. 
So I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Professor Mike Tull, AO. Professor Tull is a medical epidemiologist and public health physician with more than 45 years of experience working in the health sector in low and middle income countries in Asia, Africa, the Middle East and the Pacific. Professor Tull has expertise in maternal and child health and nutrition, communicable disease control, including HIV prevention and care, health security, sexual and reproductive health, and public health in conflict affected and refugee populations. Professor Tull is currently the technical advisor to the No COVID-19 Knowledge Hub at the Burnett Institute. And between 1995 and 2012, he was the head of the Burnett Institute's Center for International Health, providing technical and management leadership on a range of community health and development projects in the Asia Pacific. Professor Tull was awarded a member of the Order of Australia in 2013. Please welcome Professor Mike Tull. Thank you, Michael, and um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the organisers and particularly the Melbourne Museum. I'm a bit hoarse. <clears throat> Don't worry about it. It's um, nothing serious. So I'm just going to um, talk about my experience um, during the pandemic from both a personal point of view and uh, a professional point of view. So um, a little background, because I don't think many of you know me. I um, can't actually read the slide from here. Um, but I graduated from Monash uh, Medical School in 1971, which is exactly 50 years ago. I did an internship in Perth, then a medical residency in Chiang Mai, in a hospital in Chiang Mai, followed by a um, course in tropical public health in London. I went back to Thailand for five years, and then... Um, much later, I did a diploma in um, advanced epidemiology at the New England Institute of Epidemiology. Okay, so that's a photo of me as a harassed young doctor, um, <clears throat> probably 1976. I was seeing about 200 outpatients a day. And yes, I was harassed. I had to learn, I already spoke Thai, but I had to learn three new languages to work in that clinic. Um, including Lao, Hmong, and another uh, minority language. Um, my next assignment straight after was in Somalia, where I was the medical advisor to what was called the Refugee Health Unit. Um, the guy standing next to me was the then director of that um, unit, which covered 35 camps across the country in what is a very large and sparsely populated desert country. So we were traveling all the time for those two years. Oops, back. So then I had a number of um, appointments, which I can't read, <laughs> but I came back to Melbourne and worked for uh, Oxfam as their health advisor, then went to the US Centers for Disease Control for 10 years where I coordinated the US response or public health response um, <clears throat> to um, what came to be known as complex humanitarian emergencies. So these were always conflict um, associated emergencies. I came back here in 1995 where I, as Michael said, I was the head of the Center for International Health. Um, my, own field work was focused in Laos, because I, I speak Lao, um, and Tibet, Myanmar, and Papua New Guinea. And that was on a range of issues, most of them initially related to HIV and later nutrition. Um, I then did a lot of work on the polio eradication program. That photo at the bottom is with my colleague, Ben Coughlin, when we did our first review of the um, polio program in Afghanistan. Um, he's been back once and I've been back three times. So we've both uh, worked a lot in Afghanistan. I decided after my last trip, I would not go back because I was abandoned at an empty airport in the east of the country and had to sit around for two hours uh, waiting for a plane to come and pick me up. Um, I then spent two years um, going backwards and forwards to Guinea, which is not exactly up the road, uh, in West Africa, evaluating the US response 
to Ebola, and then came along 2020. So I was in Egypt when the pandemic began. Why? Because I've been in a, part, um, a relationship there since 2009 with this young man, and yes, this was our first date. So <laughs> beat that. <laughs> So my partner's name is Adil. Uh, we have a flat in Cairo, but we spend a lot of time in Alexandria, which is our favorite place. And this is a Spitfire, our favorite bar, which is around about 120 years old um, as a very interesting place. So in January uh, last year, we were in Aswan in the south of um, of Egypt for Coptic Christmas. We often go down there. It's a beautiful time of year, middle of winter, but cool, crisp, sunny days. Um, that time we splurged, or I splurged, and we stayed at what I think is the most fantastic hotel in the world called the Old Cataract. So just after we checked in, we were having lunch and I, I um, connected with Wi-Fi and found the New York Times, and saw this article. China identifies a new virus causing pneumonia-like illness. Now, they said in that article that it was probably not being spread person to person. Um, they ate their words later. Um, but because I've been working on pandemic preparedness for some time, I felt a sense of dread. But I kind of filed it away and we enjoyed our holiday in Aswan. So en route back to Melbourne, I stopped over in Beirut Airport and again, three weeks later, checked the New York Times. WHO declares a global emergency. So from 54 cases in Wuhan, my first reading, it had gone up to 10,000 um, globally and I knew this, this was going to be very bad. So I got back to Melbourne um, the end of January I cut short the long service leave I was on. I had a meeting with my boss. He suggested I might postpone <clears throat> my retirement from June until September, but he didn't specify which year. Um, I took possession of an adorable little puppy, just so timely, called Mika. Um, at that time, Australia had very few cases. Our first case was reported 25th of January, but trends overseas, particularly in Italy, um, indicated that it was inevitable to enter Australia. So I have a long history working in China. Um, just in the middle of 2019, I had a meeting with the head of the China CDC and the deputy director of the National Health Commission. I tried to contact them, but didn't get many messages back. So I was assigned as the technical advisor to a newly established knowledge hub um, and of course, as a viral institute, we, we had to take this seriously. My initial task was to produce a biweekly global health update that was uploaded to the Hubs West website. And that's the dog. So she's a very rare breed from Madagascar. There's only about 50 of that type of dog in Australia. So the Knowledge Hub has three sections. One publishes our modeling exercises, then our public health responses, um, any technical um, studies that we've done. And the one that I was involved with was global analysis. So I'll just quickly go through these slides, but early on you can see that they were mainly country case studies, positive and negative examples. Portugal was a very and Greece were very good examples of responses at that time. And because we were in the first lockdown, we were very interested in how countries were considering how to ease restrictions. May, again, easing restrictions, a few technical things like digital contact tracing, I think that was in South Korea, um, the impact on essential health services in low and middle income countries and other case studies like Vietnam and Papua New Guinea. Now, this is a graph that from the European CDC that I've been following right since the beginning. So it'll be right back um, to the left 
of the screen. And you can see it's been a roller coaster. And the bad news is that since February, we're in the middle of a huge global surge of cases. And you can see to the right there that it's in every region, it's in Europe, and particularly clear in that slide is the increase in Asia, which is largely due to India. And of course, the, the Americans. Deaths again are surging. So then came Victoria's second wave and you could see Burnett really mobilized and were involved in a lot of activities. I personally did a lot of advocacy for mandatory mask wearing by sharing the evidence, doing opinion pieces in newspapers. Um, we did forward modeling based on various interventions and what would be the outcomes. A lot of staff were seconded to the Department of Health and Human Services, basic science research on variants, diagnostic tests, vaccines and drugs. Uh, the optimised study is ongoing. In fact, there was a lot of media coverage yesterday looking at the social impacts of the pandemic. Um, I was involved with a pilot program with the Yarra Council to try and show the effectiveness of decentralising testing um, and community-based responses. Uh, we did studies of the effects on young people and people who inject drugs. Um, we had staff seconded to the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre and I was involved in its evaluation. Uh, we did an analysis of the impact of school closures and retrospective modelling to see what worked the best. So towards the end of the year, I noticed a surge in new information on a whole lot of topics, but they were dominated by vaccines and variants. So we decided to split the update into two volumes. The volume two had updates on vaccines and variants. We had a section, and I'll quickly go through this, on global snapshots on a whole variety of topics. And you can see airborne transmission, um, an evaluation of the factors that infected infection in aged care homes, um, long COVID, um, another clinical syndrome in children, which is very serious, uh, randomized trial of convalescent plasma, excess mortality, um, a terrible outbreak occurred in Singapore due to negligence, really, among migrant workers. And we um, did a thing on that. Uh, the impact on a variety of programs, including specifically polio, the impact on global health security, the effects on the world's nurses. Thousands have died. Oxygen supplies, particularly in Africa. Um, looking at the association between high mortality and overweight, um, looking at the, um, the accuracy of rapid diagnostic tests and um, looking at the immune response to natural infections. So just some reflections. Most countries, the response was a failure. I think Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan have been the very rare exceptions. In many cases, governments ignored public health advice. And the most obvious examples were the US, the UK, Brazil, Turkey, Russia, India, and Indonesia, but a lot more. And as you know from the US, some things like masks became politicized. Now that there were blind spots, such as Singapore, which still has the highest um, infection rate in the whole of Asia. Um, and they ignored their migrant workers, leading um, to around 55% of them being infected. Sweden's lethal social experiment, which I call eugenics, that killed more than 12,000 elderly residents and did not achieve the misguided goal of herd immunity. I think the history books will, will blame and shame Sweden, deservedly. So the rare success stories are mostly in the Indo-Pacific region. Taiwan is probably number one. China, Vietnam, Mauritius, New Zealand, Australia, Cambodia, Brunei, and Fiji. But it changes. Cambodia now has a soaring second wave, and Fiji's just reported four cases of community transmission. 
Looking at my own influence, I think I can probably pinpoint an influence on policy about masks in Victoria. Obviously, it didn't work in New South Wales. Um, Decentralised testing hubs, which the Department of Health has done. There are now seven or nine. And on hotel quarantine. Again, the influence has really been confined to Victoria and South Australia. Just today, there is a second outbreak of COVID in a quarantine hotel in Sydney. That's two in one week. They just won't learn. Then there were the media. Um, I, I wasn't prepared for this. I'd done some media in the US about refugees and wars, but it was always with the New York Times or the Washington Post. It was supervised by our media office. And here, I mean, it's just, I've been keeping a spreadsheet on Excel. And as of today, except I just got a new one. So it was now it's 521 media engagements. It includes um, nine opinion pieces for the Sydney Morning Herald, Age, Canberra Times, and five pieces for the conversation. Most of those have been the Sydney Morning Herald. They have been extremely open to our opinion pieces from the Burnett. And I now have all their numbers on in my contacts. So you can see this, I haven't missed any um, major outlet. So all the TV stations, ABC Radio in all states, Radio National, um, The Age, Australian, Herald Sun, Financial Review, Guardian, Saturday Paper, New Daily. And I've been on most of the um, current affairs programs, 7.30, I've got another 7.30 appearance coming up in May, The Drum, The Project, Afternoon Briefing, Today Show, and Seven Sunrise are the ones that arrive at my flat at 6.30 in the morning with the film crew. That's after being woken up at 5.30. <laughs> Uh, very strangely, oddly, weekly appearances on Sky News during the daytime, not at night. I wouldn't go near Sky News at night. But that was interesting. And then someone said to me, look, if there's a guy sitting in a pub in Western Sydney who says, hey, that guy knows what he's talking about, then I've achieved something. Many community and regional um, stations I had a peak in January and February when the UK and Ireland were introducing hotel quarantine and they all wanted to know how our system worked. So I was on all the BBC Radio 4, I was told afterwards, is the most watched um, media segment of the day, BBC TV, ITV, Radio Scotland. And then Ireland, Germany, Russia, Bulgaria, Singapore, South Korea, Canada and the US and Japan. So just some, I had an on-call arrangement with Al Jazeera in Doha, so they can just call me anytime. Memorable media moments, the my live interview with Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain was the scariest. I kept getting um, texts from British friends saying, cancel, cancel, don't do it. <clears throat> but I'd got on well with his producer, so I felt oh, I'll go through it. And she warned me about, he might go off script. And towards the end of the interview, he asked me, how do you think Boris Johnson's government has handled the response to the pandemic? And I said, well, the vaccine rollout seems to be going out really well <laughs> and avoided the other questions. Don't do live interviews at midnight. I did so on Russia today at midnight Melbourne time and I almost fell asleep. My sister watched the video and swore that I actually did fall asleep. She said, well, most Russian viewers would probably think I'd been on the vodka, which I hadn't. I think it's, it's wise not to directly criticise governments and certainly don't name people like ministers um, or prime ministers because it just comes back to bite you. Um, but don't slavishly praise them either, and I've tried to be objective. Be consistent, always back up statements with evidence, which needs a lot of homework before each interview. Allow selected journalists that you like to nurture relationships. So I just got a text from someone at the ABC AM show who's got my number. Everyone seems to have my number. Um, now I've lost what was the next. Put your phone on mute at night and that'll avoid seven sunrise calling you at 6 a.m. 
and avoid being ambushed. This was a big lesson for me. I did a, a Zoom interview with a journalist, very smart journalist, with Manichi, the largest newspaper in Tokyo. And it was based on a, an opinion piece I'd published the week before in the Sydney Morning Herald about the risks of holding the Tokyo Olympics. Midway, he ambushed me. He asked me what I thought about the comments made about women by the head of the Olympic Committee and former Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori. Well, I thought, this is off script. And I thought for a moment and said, I thought they were old fashioned and disrespectful. And there it was, those very words on the front page of that newspaper the next day. Now, I was very nervous that I'd created a diplomatic incident, but my Japanese friends, and I have quite a few, started texting me saying, it's all right, they were following the social media, saying they're all on your side. And he resigned the next day. So I don't know if that was due to me or not. <laughs> okay, I've just reached my 20 minutes, which is just missed. My memories of the pandemic, this is my last slide, are mixed. I was very fortunate to be working at home and to have a meaningful work every day. An adorable puppy and a beach, which is literally across Beach Road in Elwood. So the daily walks during the lockdown were just so important. Every day at four o'clock, we'd go out, cross the road. She'd just run crazy. She just loves the beach. And so I think that got me, helped get me through those days, which if you look you think back to the lockdown, it's hard to remember anything because every day was the same. But those walks were remarkable. On the downside, of course, I haven't seen my partner since January um, last year. He runs, Adler runs a, a small menswear store that was doing quite well before the pandemic. And then came the virus and Cairo had a 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew. So he had to close his shop at 5 p.m. And then the police would be on the door if he didn't. And I don't know if any of you have been to Cairo, but people don't go shopping before five o'clock. They go after dinner when it's cool. So his business collapsed. Um, he couldn't see his friends because they had the same limit on how far he could go. He couldn't go to the cafe and smoke shisha. So he had a very, very lonely pandemic, even though we spoke every day on, on, on WhatsApp. Um, things have come back. He's back in the store. It's Ramadan and he's selling well. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, it's really an incredible breadth of work that you've been involved in, but also quite um, some sobering data and stories. Um, shows we're really not out of this yet. Um, our next speaker is Professor Deborah Williamson. Professor Williamson is a clinical and public health microbiologist and professor and director of microbiology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Doherty Institute. She is also a laboratory head in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne and a Dame Kate Campbell Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Professor Williamson is an NHMRC Investigator Grant recipient, received a L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Fellowship in 2017, and was awarded the Australasian Society Infectious Diseases Frank Frenner Award in 2020. Please welcome Deb Williamson. Hi there, good evening, and um, thanks so much for uh, for inviting me to talk this evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land uh, on which we meet, and uh, I guess wherever you are at home and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And as Michael says, uh, um, uh, I am a, a, a microbiologist, a pathologist, and I guess my talk will be um, uh, focusing more on that aspect, I guess, um, of the pandemic. Just a wee bit of background, um, I guess, about me and where I'm from. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm not from around these parts. I um, went to medical school. I'm actually from the east coast of Scotland, and I went to medical school uh, across the country, across the 40 miles across the country, which uh, well, seemed adventurous at the time. Uh, I went to medical school at the University of Glasgow. 
which is a great place, a really great place to live and, uh, uh, and study. Um, I did a, um, a medical degree there, but I also did a science degree in virology. Um, and um, there sort of ignited my dual passions, if you like, of uh, uh, microbiology and infectious diseases and running as well. And um, uh, uh, that's the, the um, one and only marathon of my uh, uh, life there. And I, I strongly suspect it will remain the one and only marathon of my life. But there it is. And I'll show that uh, photograph to whoever uh, cares to see it. Um, after that, I moved down to London. Um, Glasgow is a great place, but, you know, bright lights, big, bigger city um, attracted. And uh, I went down to London to do physician's training at St Mary's Hospital uh, in Paddington. And I used to walk past, um, I don't know if you can see it um, in the top picture, but there's a wee purple plaque on the wall, which is shown below. And I used to walk past um, the, the, the room uh, where Fleming discovered penicillin every day on my way into work. And I, I know I thought, a bit geeky. I mean, I thought that was really cool. I used to walk through those gates every day and I thought, gee, that is, that is something else. Um, and then also, um, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, in St. Mary's Hospital, um, but it also, I also gave birth to uh, my eldest daughter in that hospital, there when, when I was in London. And um, so St Mary's, I would say, holds a, a pretty special place uh, in my heart. Um, and then in 2007, you know, London was a great place to be, but um, it changed a lot in the early 2000s. It was, there were, I guess there was a bit more crime. There was some bomb threats and, uh, or actual, uh, you know, there was um, the bombings in the in, uh, um, mid 2000s. And so um, we, did, we had family over in New Zealand and decided to move over to, to New Zealand with a young child. Um, and it was fabulous. I have to say, I love New Zealand. I, I never thought that we could anywhere could be as beautiful. I won't say more beautiful, but as beautiful as Scotland. But there certainly is. And, you know, and it, it's just a lovely place. Um, and so I did my clinical microbiology training in Auckland and I did my PhD in Auckland as well at the University of Auckland. And then was recruited over to Melbourne um, in, in 2015. And I started my job in Melbourne as the deputy director of one of the public health labs at the Doherty. Um, and then more recently, to, in November 2019, um, I started formally as the, the director of microbiology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, uh, um, looking a wee bit older in the, the photo on, on the right. And so when I started in November 2019, I had grand plans for the year ahead, um, as I'm, I'm sure that we all did, right? So uh, grand plans of coming in and, you know, revamping this aspect and, you know, really getting time to settle into the job. Uh, but before I started the job, before I really started the job in earnest, um, I took um, my oldest daughter, um, who at that time was um, just a, a young teenager, to um, LA. So we decided just to go on a, um, a holiday to LA. And I thought, this will give me a wee bit of a break before I come back and settle into my crazy year. And so, um, like Michael um, uh, described in the previous talk, um, I was and I not, I, I, this photograph was taken in Disneyland. And that's me on the roller coaster there. And if ever there was a metaphor for the year ahead, I guess that would be it. Um, and, you know, what really got me suspicious that this was going to be, this was something else, was logging on and seeing on the front page of the New York Times that there was something taking off in China. And I don't know if you're familiar with American news, but usually to get international news, you know, it takes you five minutes to go through the paper and then you get to like a page in the, in this, in the paper called international news. But this was on the front page and I thought, oh, that's odd. Um, and anyway, like, like Mike, I filed it away and got on with the rest of um, the holiday. But this was 2020. And, I, you know, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, like many people, I, I've um, fluctuated between the scraggy hair in the middle and the straight jacket. Did feel a bit of the getting the elbows out in the supermarket, I think, for the toilet paper. Um, and then ultimately settled on the bottom right one there um, and struggling to, to, to shed that, I would say, at the moment. 
anyway, but um, the, yep, uh, 2020 happened. And so, you know, are we, uh, my co our colleagues and I in the lab had a discussion very early on and we said, what can we do, right? We were not directly involved in, um, I guess, the epidemiology and the way that, that Mike described. We weren't directly involved in vaccine development and we weren't directly involved in the clinical care of patients. And this was a very early conversation. We said, what can we do? Um, then it became very clear that testing was going to be one of the really fundamental parts of the response. And put very simply, without a test result, there's no public health response. And so what we decided to do was to use our pathology training and really, I guess, embrace it. And that, I think from a, a, a mental point of view, just to be busy and just to be doing that, I think was really important for that year. And, you know, laboratory testing was not straightforward at all and, and continues to, to, to raise challenges. And it wasn't just about, oh, what, what, um, what machine shall we test it on? There's a huge amount of um, things to, to try and work out. Who do we test? How do we get the specimens from them to the lab quickly? Which platform do we use? How do we keep this workforce who are doing the testing and don't forget behind every single test there's a scientist running that test and these guys have been flogging themselves around the clock hidden away right and so how do we keep that workforce going how do we make sure that we deliver high quality tests so we don't just use any old you know um, crappy test that, that somebody says is a good test how do we report the results uh, how do we interpret the results so a whole bunch of things to think about with the testing this, I have to say, like Mike, the media really took more interest in laboratory testing than I, I would ever have thought possible. Um, but, you know, there was always the next great test. There were the sniffer dogs that you might have heard about. There was the moonshine or sorry, moonshot program from <laughs> from the UK. Uh, there was the, the, the 22nd scre screening test in airports. I mean, there was every day it seemed um, and in another context, as a microbiologist, I might find that exciting, but it was, it was like, oh, no, we're going to be asked about this. You know, if you saw a new test, you thought immediately thought we're, we're going to be asked to look at this. Anyway, so what we wanted to do was also to look at some novel diagnostic approaches. So not just standard testing, but we thought, let's look at some, some things that might be a bit outside the box. And we were one of the first groups last year, very early last year, to consider the use of saliva as a diagnostic test. Um, and so we compared, we worked with the team uh, uh, in the ED at the Royal Melbourne, and we compared saliva to nasopharyngeal swabs, and we found it was less sensitive, but it wasn't too bad. And we got that information out quite quickly. Um, and this is a pattern, by the way, whenever we, we looked at something, the media always picked it up. Um, and so this um, and the saliva story has been an evolving story. Right. So initially that was going to be rolled out in a small way and then it was rolled out to regional Victoria. And now it forms an integral part of testing in the hotel quarantine service, uh, uh, hotel, hotel quarantine system. Another um, particular <laughs> favorite of ours were the lateral flow antibody tests. So these were the tests that came onto the market quite early last year. You know, the ones where you do a finger prick test and it'll tell you whether you've had COVID. Um, and we were asked to look at these um, and evaluate them. Uh, that's what they look like. They look like a, a little pregnancy test. Um, and we published on that quite early on as well. Um, and we found that actually, you know what, when they were used in the right way at the right time, so not immediately after you might have, oh, not when you have, um, you know, the, the, in the acute stages of illness, because it takes time for antibodies to develop, right? Um, but when you, when you use them in the right way, they actually weren't that bad. Um, and, uh, and that work continues to be um, uh, um, put up on the TGA website. But again, it was picked up by the media. And, you know, the, the, um, uh, and, you know, I was asked to comment on this a number of times in the media. And, and you know, as Mike said, it's hard to keep that balance and you, you do get ambushed. And you know, the common question that I was always asked was, you know, um, have we wasted our money buying all of these tests? And my answer was always, no, you know, you can never be too prepared. The other tests that we were asked to look at were these rapid antigen tests. And, you know, these came on the market to, uh, or the, uh, the, 
word started to get about about these tests towards the, the, the tail end of the second wave in Victoria. And intuitively, these tests, you know, are very attractive in as much as you, there are 15 minute tests, you can take a swab from somebody and it's a point of care test, right? And you can, um, in a very simple way, um, you know, the way that they were sold, I guess, was you can tell whether somebody has COVID. Well, actually, that's a yes and a no. It's less sensitive than PCR in a low prevalence setting. False positives are an issue. Um, but what I think these tests and these tests are used extensively, I have to say, in the UK and the US now. But these tests, I think offered hope at a time when there didn't seem to be much. And we've never rolled them out in a big way in Australia, but you know, just reading about something that, that could give you hope and could get you out and about again, I think was important. Um, again, you know, this work, we published on this work and it was, it was picked up um, and uh, yeah, picked up, we published on it earlier this year and it was picked up by the media. Uh, one other thing I didn't know was that the age have a comment section. <laughs> and so, um, you know, never read comments on something that you've commented on. I mean, it's, it's uh, or never read comments on something where you are in the article, because um, it's, it's pretty soul destroying, actually. Anyway, and then the other tests, um, I guess, that has been almost like a flagship, I would say, during the pandemic have been genom has been genomics. And if somebody had said to me at the start of 2020, you, you will see the Victorian Premier waving a report that and he, talking about genomic sequencing, you know, in a few months, I would have said, you're, you know, you're dreaming. Uh, but that actually happened. And so we did a lot of work looking at the door uh, and particularly colleagues at the Doherty did a lot of work looking at the genomics of this. So what strains were circulating? Where did they come from? And of course, that's the story of the second wave, right? So the genomics were able to trace back that, that second wave to a breach in hotel quarantine. So that's a sort of whistle stop tour, if you like, of different diagnostic tests. I mean, most of you I'm suspecting will have had a COVID test at some point. It will involve a swab going up your nose, that swab going to a lab and a PCR test being done. That's a workhorse of testing. But what I've shown you is that there are a range of other tests around that that we've looked at. And that's important. That's just doing due diligence. Um, and then, yeah, just to say that I have to say, as pathologists, we're sort of natural introverts. You know, we like to sit in our labs and, you know, we like to look at our computer screens. But this, I mean, uh, pathology was front and centre um, for a lot of the time during this test, during this um, pandemic response. Um, and th this was the aspect I really found uh, uh, pr professionally most challenging, not the data, not evaluating the test, not interpreting the data, but actually, you know, facing the media every time we did something. And um, uh, um, but I think it's important. And by and large, I think that, um, you know, a reasonable job was done of um, conveying information about these tests to the public. But I never thought also I would see so many middle aged men in lab coats, um, <laughs> thankfully, seeing us through and steering us through the pandemic. Clearly, one of those is not a middle aged man. But you know, she really should have her hair tied back. I think we would all agree with that. What kept me sane during the pandemic? <clears throat> I would love to say that it was taking up a new hobby that I was now, you know, an ace crocheter or that I got fit and fabulous. Uh, I didn't. Um, but what kept me sane were the simple things. Um, and um, it was it was family. Um, and that's um, my um partner and our younger daughter there, my partner's just over there, um, who actually gave a talk um, to this audience a couple of years ago. Um, uh, she um, will kill me, but she'll want me to point out that she's sitting there um, uh, uh, and that's not Corona kilos that she's carrying. She's actually having a baby in a couple of months. So um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sure kill me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> what kept me sane? Yeah, family, 
food. Uh, uh, um, some of her delicious um, concoctions are portrayed there and memes, really, and particularly animal memes. They were the things that got, that, that got me through last year. What did we learn in the lab? Well, I hope I've showed you that we need a diversity of testing methods. We at least need to look at them, be responsive and be part of the solution. You know, there's a, I heard a lot of um, sniping and, um, oh, that's not going well, but you know, just get on and, and do something. Um, and um, I'm not sure if you've been down Royal Parade recently, but I felt very, very honored and privileged to be part of, um, uh, that mural there, which was put up partway through. And, you know, I, I really, that gave me a lot of pep, if you like, um, going uh, into work every day and seeing that. Um, and and the, some of the colleagues on there, some of their, of my colleagues on there, their efforts were um, no less than heroic, I would say. And thanks very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks Deb for that. Um, so we have about 10 minutes now for a Q&A uh, session. So if anyone has a question and wants to kick us off in the audience. Yes, Sarah, just wait. Yeah, we'll get a microphone so people at home can hear you. Thank you both for sharing an amazing body of work. One thing that I'm quite interested in understanding is um, host versus pathogen genetics and the role that's playing um, with the COVID outbreaks, because you spoke about aged people being more susceptible, overweight people being more susceptible. But I'm wondering what work's been happening in the host genetics uh, point, uh, particularly if we look at Brazil. Uh, so Brazil's got the pathogen variant that's, that's occurring, but there's also a lot of children uh, getting very ill in Brazil um, and dying. So I'm wondering if you know anything about that. Yeah, look, that, that's a that's a, um, a a really excellent question, um, and uh, I I, um, I couldn't comment on that. I mean, I'm, my work isn't looking at that. Um, I know that work is ongoing. Um, I would just say that most of the work on this will come out of countries that have a much higher prevalence than ours. Um, uh, and it's hard to comment on the situation in Brazil because we don't know what other comorbidities those children have had. Um, and one can imagine that it's um, complex um, and for certain countries context specific as well. Um, uh, certainly the emerging variants are of, of, of major concern, particularly the one coming out of Brazil. I mean, Mike may want to comment here um, uh, on some of the, I guess, medical comorbid factors that have emerged during the pandemic. I've been reading about Brazil for most of the day. Um, I think there's a number of different things going on in Brazil. Um, certainly there's the variant and the variant seems to affect younger people more than the older strains. So it's not just in Brazil, it's in Chile, it's in Ontario province, um, British Columbia, uh, Michigan in the US. Um, <clears throat> but then there's, it's confounded by young people having different behaviours, you know, perhaps more active, having to go out to work more than older people. And of course, even in Brazil, older people are being vaccinated. Um, I think what's scary is the P1 variant is it, is itself mutating. And there's a recent paper preprint that shows there is considerable new mutations in the P1. They haven't given it a new name yet. But in Brazil, um, if you look at cases in young, in the 30s, people in their 30s, they've increased 600% since January. So something's going on. It's the same in Ontario. Um, just under a half of the patients in ICU in Toronto are under the age of 30. So something's happening and it seems to be related to that P1 
particular variant. It wasn't seen with the B117 variant from the UK or the B351 variant from um, South Africa. But we will learn more. <laughs> Um, Mike, I might ask you a question. You mentioned in your talk the media interest in our hotel quarantine program overseas. And I guess in Australia, we had the unique opportunity to evaluate a whole lot of interventions during our second wave. How much do you think of the lessons that we learnt here in Australia have actually been adopted overseas? I think, so. well, I ask how many of them have been adopted in Australia? Um, <laughs> I think masks have certainly, so our ability to show that masks probably led to about a 40% reduction in cases has had a big impact internationally. Um, I think the big lesson that we should have learned and haven't is aerosol transmission. And I think it's a disgrace. It's a real disgrace. And there are so-called scientists out there in Australia, including the co-head of the infection control expert group, who's a professor at, at ANU, denying that airborne transmission even exists. I mean, any fool could see that this week in Sydney, on two occasions, the virus spread from one room to another. How can that happen without aerosol transmission? You don't have to be a scientist. And it happened in the Holiday Inn in Melbourne. It happened in um, that hotel in, in Adelaide. It's happened in Queensland, in Brisbane. Queensland is another denier. They, they are even worse than New South Wales. Um, you know, they say, oh, we're going to investigate those cases. And then we never hear what they found. Except, oh, it's probably a surface. There's about 140 million cases so far globally. Not a single case out of those 140 million has been proven to have been transmitted via a surface. Not one. And our so-called leading experts in the infection control expert group still advise people to, you know, do the hygiene theatre and you know, clean out for 48 hours. It doesn't do anything. Um, so I'm afraid some lessons have not been learned. And I, I'm not optimistic about New South Wales and Queensland. And West Australia is also the same. Only South Australia and Victoria have openly acknowledged that airborne transmission is a thing. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, thank you very much both for sharing the personal stories during the pandemic. I think this is, this is an important factor and I love it. I wanted to return though to the variant question and, and try and take you into perhaps some scary territory and ask, you know, is there a sign of the first variant that will attract vaccine developers to develop a vaccine specifically against that variant? And looking forward even further in your crystal balls, you know, when, how long will it take before we reach the situation where this is a, a seasonal virus in, in the same way as flu is? You know, can you put your crystal balls in front of you, give them a polish and have a look? <laughs> well, I think it, it's become a race between variants and vaccines. That, that's, that's clear. Um, and that's why we, we need to accelerate vaccination to prevent further variants from happening. At the moment, in a place like India that reported 270,000 cases yesterday, let's take that in, 270,000 cases. It's like the population of Geelong. Um, new variants will arise and there already is a new variant in India. It's not yet clear what impact it's having because the B117 is there also, in fact, more of the B117 than the new B516 um, in India, which has a double mutation on the spike protein that is worrying people. So one of the, the mutations is similar to the South African one, which seems to not respond to vaccines as well. So you probably know in a trial, which wasn't very big, the AstraZeneca um, vaccine had zero efficacy in South Africa. Um, the Novavax vaccine had a much lower efficacy, around 50%. Um, and 
There's another one that's been tested there, Johnson & Johnson also. So I think in terms of boosters, yeah, I, in fact, the CEO of Pfizer said yesterday that he thinks there'll have to be third doses, so a booster, and then perhaps every year. Now, Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca are working on um, vaccines that will respond to, well, will protect against these variants. And the Pfizer and Moderna probably have the best hope of developing them because the mRNA vaccines are very easy to modify, whereas the adenovirus vector vaccines take a lot longer. So I don't know if you know, but the Pfizer vaccine was developed in 42 days by this brilliant husband and wife team who are the son and daughter of Turkish immigrants in Germany, 42 days. So I'd have some hope that those two companies that produce mRNA vaccines can develop um, boosters that protect against the variants, but have less hope with the others. Yeah, I would echo that. In, re in relation to the comment about seasonal infection, that won't happen until and uh, 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 until many, many more people are vaccinated. And that is entirely contingent, contingent on, um, uh, uh, I guess, political will and infrastructure. Do we have time for one more quick question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, my name's Ben. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, Deborah, I wondered what you see as the future of testing over the next 12 months, particularly if Australia can maintain its low prevalence of COVID-19. There was a period there where I thought the proposals that everyone each morning would do the $1 in you know, a rapid antigen test and if you got a false positive, well, you know, or you've cost yourself is a, a day waiting for the PCR result to, you know, show it was a false positive. That seemed sort of sensible. And a, a mate of mine I saw on Instagram the other day was posting a picture of they're getting, I think, five of these tests, you know, given freely to them to use per month um, without much direction, though, it seems, as to how to use them. And I think there was some concern from him about how that might be then affecting overall complacency and um, adherence to social distancing and other non-pharmaceutical interventions. Just wondering if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, look, that's an excellent question. Uh, we are extremely fortunate here um, uh, in as much as, you know, we have very strong PCR um, uh, capacity and capability. Um, and so, um, by no means have we maxed out our PCR uh, capacity here, um, but not just in Victoria, but, but across the country as well. That is the absolute gold standard test. Anything else? Um, yes, we've looked at it, but anything else is less than the gold standard. I'm a, I guess I'm a pathologist. I'm um, uh, somewhat of a purist when it comes to this, and, and, and I certainly would... would um, say that here there is very little excuse for not doing a PCR test, but you know we are in in um, a, a unique situation globally, um, and so um, you know countries have had to um, to mobilise these point of care, rapid, less sensitive tests, um, almost as a triage. Um, there's a study that's just um, about to come out in the UK, actually showing that. Um, these tests can, um, uh, in some instances, only 10% of them are confirmed by PCR. Um, and that's, that's looking at a range of these different antigen tests, but it's also looking at where um, the prevalence is lower. Um, and so people think that, you know, if you get a test result and, you know, I, I, you know if it's, um, uh, and look mainly at things like sensitivity and specificity, but that's that is not um, taking into account the context of where you are and what the, the prevalence is. So we use things like you know positive predictive value or negative predictive value. They're not reported on what people are what people will report on and the media actually are you know the, the reported sensitivity and specificity of the test. But what we should be looking at is things like the positive and negative predictive value. Um, I don't think that we will be, be adopt. Uh, I may yet eat my words, but I don't think we'll be adopting antigen tests here in Australia. Fantastic, and that's it. Oh, online question.
or realize you might have overlooked. This one or country? I think uh, both. Uh, I don't know. Uh, don't, yes, that was just asked. Could have been hindsight. Is there anything you do differently or realize you might have overlooked? That's a good question. <laughs> you haven't had time to reflect on it. Probably yeah, that's do. right. That's, yeah. Um, you know what, probably from a very personal perspective, I probably would have tried to take better care of myself. Um, and uh, and that, that, that you can actually only say with hindsight. I suspect it's the same for everybody here in this audience and everybody watching is a look back and go, you know what, I wish I'd just... Um, uh, uh, paid a bit more attention to my mental health and my physical health. Um, and I don't think we were prepared at all for what happened in Victoria. And I think we'll be feeling the consequences of that for many years to come. Yeah, I think technically or professionally, I think following on to my comment um, a couple of minutes ago is that I should have paid more attention to ventilation much earlier. Um, in fact, you know, very soon after the initial breach in quarantine in Victoria. And we'll never know how that happened. Um, but I think we should have tweaked much earlier. And I think the problem was that there is a school of respiratory physicians and researchers who still hold on to theories that were developed almost 100 years ago. They won't let go. They still, some of them don't, knowledge that tuberculosis and measles are transmitted um, through aerosols. You know, it's quite, I'm not a respiratory physician, and I was new to this whole sort of landscape of, of these sort of dinosaurs and then the people that are trying to you know, throw meteors at them. <laughs> um, <laughs> personally, I did well on the food front. I actually experimented with lots of new recipes. I did not put on any, in fact, I lost kilos. Um, probably should have been a little bit more careful about alcohol. Like having the first drink at five instead of what used to be seven um, and it becomes a habit. But uh, otherwise, I think I had a pretty good run of it. Do you have another one, one more? Um, Halo. I have a question about Australia's vaccine rollout. Do you think the most effective way to vaccinate our nation is to build a new facility capable of mRNA vaccine production? That's, I think, in the news today. Have they read the news? Huh. The, it, oh, the comment. I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's vaccine. Yep. So the question well, yeah, is they... about the, the capability to um, yeah. generate, you know, produce mRNA vaccine? I'd just say it's just one, um, one part of the strategy. It's not necessarily going to solve the whole problem. The magic, not the magic bullet. No. no, I think it's a great development. Um, I wonder whether $50 million is even enough. I don't know enough about the technical aspects of producing those vaccines, but I know they're not simple. And because we've got these worldwide shortages of of the basic ingredients and or, or things that, you know, it's like these 600 litre plastic bags, which definitely you can't find anywhere in the world. Um, I think we need a number of other prongs, including um, looking at whether we can actually purchase Moderna. Um, we've got Novavax coming up, but we don't know when. I think it'll be the third quarter. That will be a very good vaccine. And also try and negotiate bigger quantities of Pfizer. Otherwise, we're stuck, really. Fantastic. Thank you. So I think we have some closing. I think we do have some closing words uh, in a minute, but I just can everyone please uh, join me in thanking Professor Deb Williamson and Professor Mike Tool. Hello. Um, I'm a representative from the Royal Society of Victoria and I'm very quickly starting a timer. Um, 
at the end of talks that the Royal Society of Victoria is involved in, we provide a vote of thanks. Um, I now get the challenge of having to contextualize the Royal Society, this seminar series, the vote of thanks and the talks we had tonight in five minutes rather than the 20 minutes our wonderful speakers had. Um, so the Royal Society of Victoria is one of Australia's learned societies. The Royal Society in England was started by the likes of Isaac Newton and Tycho Bray when they were arguing about the nature of the universe. Royal societies across the world exist predominantly in countries that were colonised by England. Um, and now we have the Royal Society of Victoria, which has been promoting science, science communication and support for science across Victoria since 1854. I've had the honour of being a counsellor, um, not a someone who talks to you about your problems, although I am willing to do that, but someone who sort of sits on the council of the Royal Society of Victoria for the last six years. Um, and I am so incredibly privileged to have been the person that brought the Royal Society of Victoria and Queers and Science together last year to initially run this lecture series um, for the very first time last year. This lecture series is really important to me for a number of reasons. Um, it was the first time I saw a non-binary person give a science talk ever. Right. And as a non-binary scientist, like, yeah, I can watch back videos of myself, but I think I know what I'm going to say. Right. So seeing someone else do it is always quite exciting. I also had the pleasure of meeting my partner at these talks last year, which means they're now a metaphor for my relationship. Um, so I'm very invested in them succeeding. So I'm glad tonight went well. The purpose of the vote of thanks is just generally for the person from the Royal Society who's giving it to reflect on the context of what we've talked about in the broader sense. So when talking about these kinds of seminars and these talks, like these talks mean a lot for the queer community, right? Like I realized we didn't really talk about the community specifically in these. And I'm really on board with that, honestly. Like we don't always have to be talking about our genders and sexualities. Sometimes we can just talk about our work, but it's still really important to have leaders in our community to be out here talking about their lives because queer health outcomes, and particularly when we're talking about health throughout the pandemic, but even before, are generally worse than that of non-queer people. And that's for a number of reasons. That might be a higher likelihood of experiencing a vast array of dis discrimination, um, whether inside the health system or outside. Or even if you look at the last year in the pandemic, like multiple queer friends of mine died during the pandemic. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in this room who've shared that experience. We don't always have awesome health outcomes and that sucks. So to have health leaders up here giving frankly two extremely terrifying talks um, about what they've been doing with the pandemic, this incredible work that's been happening in Melbourne, across Australia and across the world, it's been so meaningful. And the other part of this, these two talks, which have been fantastic, Deb and Mike, I've really, really appreciated it. As scared as they made me, love it. Um, it's so meaningful to hear about how we survive, how every person throughout this pandemic has had, frankly, a bit of a shit time, <laughs> right? Like, it's been a long year and a bit. You know, I had a conversation with a friend earlier tonight where he said, it's been a really long week. And I said, it's Wednesday. And that's how I feel about the pandemic. I feel like I've aged 10 years in about 14 months. And that doesn't feel great, but we survive and we continue to survive and we continue to grow. And I know there are people in here doing the medical research beyond our two speakers. There are people here who are doing research in all kinds of forums or are simply just interested in this work that happens, this work that is so important, not just to our community, but to everyone in the entire world, no pressure. <laughs> So it's for all of this that I move the vote of thanks on behalf of the Royal Society of Victoria, a society that's lasted 150 plus years. I'm not doing maths in my head very quickly there. 150 plus years, um, plans to survive for many more. And the work that Mike and Deb are doing that is helping save people's lives from this pandemic, that is helping, you know, it sounds really like up myself to say put Victoria on the map because like the pandemic is the more important part of this but also like to put Victoria on the map which is really nice like given everything we've put up with over the last year like I think we deserve this win um and it's just so beautiful to be here surrounded by community to hear from community about how they've survived and honestly like 
I'm not telling either of you how to feel, but how you've thrived over the last year. And so on behalf of the Royal Society of Victoria, I move this vote of thanks to thank both Mike and Deborah for fantastic talks.